Hello everyone, I'm Ken Hansen, an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Florida State University. I'm a photochemist slash photophysicist, uh, but more importantly, I'm coming to you today as the uh, chair of the Graduate Recruiting and Admissions Committee at Florida State University in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I was recently asked by our REU organizer, Ed Holinsky, to give a talk about graduate school, the process from application to PhD, and so I thought I'd record that for everyone else. A few things to note about this, uh, this is very FSU-centric, obviously it's the, the program that I I know and I'm the chair of the, the admissions committee there. Um, and also the, the aspects of graduate school are very school to school, but a lot of things will be consistent across the board. So um, a, take this with every other piece of advice you get during the process. But anyway, here's my talk, Chemistry Graduate School Dis Demystified from Application to PhD. And so looking at our, our outline for this talk, we'll start talking about the application, the application timeline, deciding where to apply, the application and admissions process, the graduate school timeline, Timeline, graduate school summary, like a final statement regarding graduate school, and then ultimately things you can do after your PhD. And so let's start out with the timeline. And so here's the rough dates for everything that occurs. You have an application deadline somewhere December 1st to 15th. This is pretty standard across all different universities. Then between December and February, and even sometimes into March, you'll get admissions decisions. You'll have visitation weekends in February and March. And then April 15th is the formal decision deadline across almost all universities. And then early August of the following uh, fall semester is the start date for graduate school. And so the first thing you have to decide during this process is where to apply. Obviously, you've, you've already decided to be a chemistry major, you're interested in graduate school, you're at least thinking about graduate school, and you're going to have to decide where to apply. And so I was brainstorming like what variables students take into account just based on conversations with this, and these are the big ones. The, the location, the salary, the department, the resources, and the research. And so we'll just go through these individually. Uh, location, there's a bunch of different stuff to consider. Uh, weather is uh, obviously a consideration. If you, if you like snow, then don't come to graduate school in Florida. Alternatively, if you hate snow, the South is a good alternative to that. And so, again, that matters. Proximity to home, this could be a pro or a con. Do you want to stay close to home? Do you want to get as far away as possible? Um, that is totally up to you and your circumstance in life. But this is an opportunity to start up and have a, a position somewhere. You can either go somewhere else or stay in the area. Other things like hobbies. If you're into surfing, obviously don't go to graduate school in Kansas, right? Uh, alternatively, I mean, if you like snowboarding, don't go to Florida. And so again, something to consider in terms of hobbies. It won't be a primary goal in your life, but if it's something you need to keep your sanity, obviously take into consideration the location you're at. Uh, the other thing I recommend for students is just life experience. Even my undergrads, while I would love to have some of them stay in my lab for graduate school, it is better for them to go somewhere else. Not only go somewhere else for from their undergrad university, University, but also go somewhere else from where they've lived. I mean, there's statistics, something like 70% of America's, Americans live within like 30 miles of their, uh, of their birthplace. And people tend not to travel, tend not to move other places. But it is a really good life experience. And graduate school, again, is a great opportunity to do that. You can transplant to a new location. And if you hate it, ultimately, you can move back. But it is an opportunity to have a life experience beyond your bubble of experience that you've had your entire life. So yeah, take it as an opportunity to see the world go out somewhere else. But one thing to note is grad school is temporary. Like five years seems like a long time. But it, again, it's only a fraction of your life experience. And so you can take this as an opportunity to explore something you might not have otherwise. See how, if you like it. If you're from a small town, go to a major city. If you're from the south, maybe go up north. If you're from the north, maybe enjoy Florida summers. It's, it's totally up to you. But again, this graduate school is an opportunity to branch out in terms of life experience. Beyond location, salary is obviously something, and I didn't know this until I did an RU program as an undergrad, that you actually get paid to go to graduate school in chemistry. And so unlike the professional schools like med school or pharmacy or physical therapy, you, there you have to pay um, in the sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, so on and so forth, you get paid to go to graduate school. And so that pay can vary dramatically. Um, here are the numbers I found, at least from CNE News. It can range from about 19,000 to 40,000. Some numbers are even getting higher than this. The average is somewhere around uh, 20 Six, five. And so that's from CNE News report in 2022. At FSU, we're at about 27000 And so that's that's the base salary. Um, other things to consider on top of that, things like tuition fees, health insurance, whether there's guaranteed support or not. Some programs don't do summer support. Some programs, um, uh, they might have you know years where you won't get paid directly through them. You'll have to have alternative employment. So it's important to read through the text and see what's actually covered in that, what's covered in your salary, what you have to pay in terms of fees. Tuition is usually 
usually going to be covered, but that's something else you want to make sure when you're looking at these uh, programs to apply to. The other thing to think about is cost of living. And so this large variation in number, it mostly reflects cost of living differences. And so if you live in an expensive city, you're going to want to get paid more. If you're not in an expensive area, then, then 19000 might be enough for you. And so you really have to take this into consideration. And there's websites that let you do these comparisons. And here's just an example from this cost of living calculator from Nerd Wallet. If you compare Tallahassee from San Francisco, $27,000 in Tallahassee is the equivalent of 53000 in San Francisco, meaning if you want to match the, the salary we offer in our graduate program in terms of cost of living and food and expenses and stuff like that, you're going to need to get paid something like 53000 And so again, that raw number, I mean, it can be impressive, but you really want to take into account what that number is going to get you in the particular city you're going to live in. And so yeah, do these cost of living calculations comparisons. And again, it's, it's one component in the graduate school process, but something that you can't ignore if you want to live, you know, reasonably comfortably. All right, other things to consider, uh, the department uh, in particular, uh, you know, there's a lot of variables that go into various departments. There's an ambiance, there's just raw statistics. Uh, one thing to look at is just raw size of the department, right? And so here's a, here's a breakdown from ACS in terms of, you know, small versus medium versus large, number of faculty 50, 20 to 33, uh, 96 versus, you know, uh, 96 is the average number of students, but it can go up pretty high up to like 183 students, which is a giant program. And so looking at FSU, we're currently at 33 research active faculty with 160 graduate students and 40 postdoc fellow fellow fellows. Um, that's, that qualifies as a large program. And so do you want to be a small fish in a big pond? Do you want to be a big fish in a small pond? Do you want to have a critical mass of friends and colleagues? Uh, this is also going to dictate the group size. Um, so you're looking at at FSU between six to 10 graduate students on average per uh, research group. And so that's something to consider. Do you want to be a lone student in a group? or do you want to be part of a bigger cohort? Another thing to think about is research strengths. And so uh, the departments aren't good at everything. Like they tend to have a lean towards particular areas of interest, particular areas of expertise. And so at FSU, we've kind of defined these as chemistry of health, chemistry of energy and materials, and advanced measurement analysis. These are very broad things, but again, these if you're interested in these areas, FSU would be a good place to pursue that. Similarly, I'll advocate FSU is really good at photochemistry. So if you want to do light-driven chemical processes, whether it's materials or molecules, FSU is a really strong history of that, as well as other things, you know, like natural product synthesis from back to tax all days, um, but also things like mass spec and magnetism based on our, our, our interactions with the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. And so every single university and chemistry program is going to have their strengths and going to have their weaken weaknesses. And this will come through typically when looking through faculty and how many faculty lean one particular flavor or another. Other things to think about, collegiality as well as social networking, like do grad students like each other? Do grad students hang out? Are people generally friends or is this an adversarial role across it? And do they have, you know, formal clubs and things like that? And speaking of formal, uh, so some things to think about are like success rates. Um, if they bring in 100 graduate students, how many of those actually graduate? And so there can be many reasons why people might not graduate, but in general, you don't want to join a program that takes in 200 students and cuts half of them the first year. Uh, typically in that case they have a lot of people that do TAs and then they get rid of them after that first day when they no longer need TAs. Uh, other programs, I think at FSU our, our washout rate is somewhere around five to ten percent and most of the time that's voluntary. Some people do get kicked out at qualifying exam or class type levels but that's something you really want to ask especially on visitations. What is the success rate and why do people not continue in the program? Other things to think about, especially now, graduate student unions. Um, these are the people that advocate for your salary raises and things like that. They're the ones that protect you. I mean, if you have a shitty advisor, you might have to deal with certain things with them. Student union is, is really helpful on that front. And so I'd recommend going to school with a graduate student union. They're the ones that will advocate for you and fight for you on your behalf for things like raises. The other thing to think about is the general ambiance of the department. And so this is this is one of the it's one of the much more subtle things. You don't necessarily see this explicitly, especially looking at departmental rankings and things. But there are departments that are actively competitive where people don't talk to each other down the hall or they're like trying to sabotage each other's work or they're competing for grants or whatever it might be. And there's other departments that are highly collaborative. People want to work a lot work with each other. Students get to talk to each other. They get to share research ideas and they also get to work together. Um, 
um, and get to pull their PIs along with them. And so uh, thankfully at FSU, we fall under the collaborative um, scenario. And here's one of our recent collaborative maps. Every one of those connecting lines is a paper shared between these faculty members. And so not only is our department collaborative, but it's something that's actively encouraged. And we have a basically a competition who can get the most collaborative lines on this graph. And so, and our students are part of facilitating that process. And so I'm really proud of what we've, uh, what we've formed at, at Florida State University. But again, it depends what you want. Do you want that collaborative environment or do you really like a cutthroat environment? And that's, that's something that's going to dictate how you behave in grad school and how successful you are. So definitely something to think about. The other thing to think about is departmental ranking. Now, I don't necessarily agree with these rankings because how they're, they're decided is kind of somewhat arbitrary. A lot of it is subjective, just uh, voting, but it does matter, right? And so if you go to US World News, um, they have rankings for institutions. And so Caltech, MIT, the Berkeley, Harvard's the world, they're always in the top five to 10. Once you get beyond the top 10, the top 25 are pretty stagnant. They stay relatively similar. Going between 25 and 75, they bounce around year to year. But it does matter what the departmental ranking is, uh, and there's been research studies on this. For example, NSF graduate fellowships disproportionately go to students at a few top schools. And so ranking does matter, whether it's just perception, and this, uh, all things being equal, perception does matter and they get more fellowships. And so it is something to consider, but I'll argue department ranking uh, pales in comparison to who you actually work for. And so that's, that's what I'm gonna argue is the most important part. And so other things to think about is the resources available to you. And so not just your salary, but not just your research group, but things like equipment and not just equipment, but do you have access to it? Do you get to use it? Uh, do you have support staff? And this could be everything from the office for purchasing things like that, or an electronic shop or a glass blower or whatever it might be. Similarly, a uh, machine shop for repairs, fixing things. Again, glass blower is critical for that. What kind of resources are available to you in the department? And do you as a grad student actually get to interact with them? And so again, a shameless plug for FSU. Uh, looking at our facilities, I'm really proud of these. You look at our NMRs, we have something like seven NMRs in the lab. We have a materials characterization lab with things like AFM, DSC, as well as magnetism measurements, mass spec, all the different flavors of mass spec you'd like, x-rays, whether it's single crystal or powder or x-ray fluorescence. Uh, something near and dear to my heart is our spectroscopy lab, which you can see a portion of it right up here. Um, if you want to do emission or absorption between 250 femtoseconds and micro to milliseconds, you can do it in our user facility. And so similarly, this is supported by a glass blower, a machine shop, an electrical shop. And so these top ones are really important. If you have staff scientists that maintain and troubleshoot and train people on instruments, you really want that available to you. And so your resume by the end of graduate school, you can have a massive list of instrumentation. Not only that, you don't have to waste time in graduate school troubleshooting an instrument because you have staff personnel to do that. And so not only having these resources, but having them so you can use them and also having people that can maintain and troubleshoot them is really, really important. And beyond that, again, glass blower, machine shop, electrical shop. If you need something fixed, if you need a unique piece of equipment like this thing, it's a dip coder from Joe Schlenoff's lab, you want people that can make that. And the, the, you have no idea how much time and effort that saves you. Even if you can go to ChemGlass and buy something, it's going to take months for a specialty build. Whereas if you have an in-house glass blower, it's going to save you so much time and effort in grad school. And so these are things you don't necessarily think about until you need them, but when you need them, you need them really bad. And so it is definitely worth looking into what equipment's available, what resources are there, what can you get access to as a graduate student. Beyond that, I'd argue the most critical thing of, in deciding where to apply to grad school is the research. And so basically any, any uh, R1 institution is going to have a list of faculty. They're going to have something that's like a side area, a list that partitions research by area. This is analytical, biochem, so on and so forth. They also typically have a list of specialties. So in this case, bioanalytical, computational, nanosciences, photochemistry, and spectroscopy. You can look what people are there, how many of them are in these given areas. For example, our materials chemistry faculty here, you can see a list of them. And so this gives you an opportunity not just to see how many people are in a given area, but also typically it's going to give some kind of descriptor of what area they work in, just a short blurb about it. And then you can click on each one of these individual web pages and look at the faculty members of interest. And so uh, one major piece of advice I'll give you is not only department strength is important, but find at least two faculty you'd be excited to work with, two or maybe three faculty. Because the truth is, even if you're really, really excited about one individual, there is no guarantee that you'll end up working for one particular faculty member. And that's just 
the, the, the rules of life. Maybe that faculty member moves, maybe they're not taking students, maybe too many students want to join and you get left out of that list. For whatever reason, there's no guarantee you'll get to join the faculty of your choosing, at least in most departments that's the case. Sometimes they accept you ahead of time. In our department, you're admitted to the department, you go through rotations, and then ultimately there's a matching process. And I'll say something like greater than 90% of students get their first choice, but that means 10% don't necessarily. And so you want to make sure when you're applying to a program, make sure there's at least one or two people that you're willing to work for at that particular program. All right, so there's the list, location, salary, department, resources, and research. Uh, most of your time is gonna be spent in lab doing research. I would argue that research is by far the, uh, the biggest priority out of this list. But again, all these factors come into play. It's a major decision. You're gonna spend several years of your life. You wanna make sure you're comfortable and happy. Uh, you wanna make sure you get paid enough. And also you want to enjoy the research that you're doing and develop the skill sets necessary to take your next steps in your career. All right, so you've decided where you want to apply to graduate programs. And so now we're going to go through basically the application process and subsequent events after that. And so we'll start with just the application deadline. And so in your application package, you'll have these main components, transcript, CV slash resume, three letters of recommendation, cover letters. Some schools require a GR. We don't anymore. Um, but generally, these are going to be pretty consistent across other departments. Um, some schools are requiring a diversity statement now as well. And so the first one, the transcript, um, this is basically already written by the time you apply, right? This is your uh, undergraduate transcript. This is your GPA. Some things to note about this, a lot of departments and even FSU looks into this. We look at uh, overall GPA as well as lower level versus upper level. Upper level basically being your most recent two years. Those are typically your senior level classes, your upper level classes, whereas lower levels, you're going to have like your gen eds and things like that. That's where your speech class lies. And so these will uh, might change depending on how well you do in your course specific or your major specific classes. The one thing to look at when applying for programs, look at a minimum GPA. Uh, typically, they'll say, you know, a, a minimum GPA to be reviewed or something like that. If they have that number, chances are that number is a pretty good indicator. If you below that it's going to be very very hard pressed to get into that program with that said there's always ex exceptions if somebody if there's a minimum of 3.0 and somebody has a 2.9 plus five publications maybe they'll advocate and get you admitted to the program anyway but in general this uh, minimum gpa is going to be a pretty good metric to say whether you're going to get into the program or not and so something worth looking at uh, the other thing, CV resume, uh, this is your opportunity to say, you know, here's the experience I've had, here's leadership positions, here's my awards, here's whatever my experience has been. Uh, things that are particularly important for graduate school, especially in any research program, is highlighting research experience, saying, you know, I worked for this person during this time in like one sentence of what you worked on, as well as any publications you have, any presentations you have, that's your opportunity to share them on the CV. Again, these are critical for grad school and research. I'd argue these are the only things that actually reflect um, your actual experience that will be applied in grad school. Uh, the other thing that's really important is the letters of recommendation. Um, we don't know what a GPA means for most schools just because it varies university to university. There's great inflation at some schools that we don't necessarily know about. So we rely heavily on the resume, but also the letters of recommendation. What is what is the person that advised you or mentored you actually say about you as a person and as a character? And so ideally you want these letters to come from people that know you well. Uh, if you had a class with a Nobel Prize winner but you never actually talked to them, that's not going to be a valuable letter even though they're a well-respected scientist. Instead you want it from someone that's going to say, you know, they had this trial and tribulation, here's how they overcame that issue, here's how they problem solved, here's what they're like to interact with on a daily basis. That is the most important letters we can get. It's something that tells some, us something about your actual character. Uh, beyond that, we want something from your research advisor. If we don't have a letter from so someone you worked for, so in your resume, you might say, I worked for so-and-so and I did this research, and we don't have a letter from them, that tends to be a red flag. And there's a lot of reasons that could happen, but uh, usually we just assume that was because you were, I don't know, a nightmare to be in lab and they didn't want to write you a letter. And so that's our, our, our worst case scenario. But again, that's what we have to go off if we don't have a letter from your research advisor. So letters from people that know you, a letter from a research advisor. 
Uh, the other thing you're going to submit is something, a, a cover letter or like a, a personal statement of some kind. It's basically along the lines of, you know, I'm interested in chemistry. Here's what I've done in the past. It's an opportunity for you to explain the research that you've worked on. It's also an important opportunity for you to say at this university, at Florida State University, I want to work for these three people. I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. I want to work in these areas in general. Um, it, it gives you a way, way to define that. Um, the other thing you can do in this letter is you can address any shortcomings in your application. Like if there's a gap in your resume, it's your opportunity to say, you know, I had to take care of my grandma for two years. That's why I dropped out of chemistry or I had a really bad semester for whatever reason. This cover letter is your opportunity to say something about that. And we read through every single one of these cover letters, at least at FSU we do. And so it does matter what you say in these. And faculty research interests, this will get you into the right pile, hopefully, in terms of someone evaluating you. So again, cover letter matters. It can be the same cover letter for every university. The only thing you have to change really is the faculty research and interests. Don't put someone from UF's name on an FSU application. That's generally frowned upon. But if you put someone that you're interested in, it, it will be read by the faculty members. Uh, the other one is GRE scores. Um, this is becoming less and less common. It's less and less important. In fact, GRE, I think the chemistry GRE has officially been phased out. It's not even offered anymore. Uh, most R1 institutions no longer accept or no longer make GRE scores mandatory. They're optional for submission, and the reality is because GRE scores don't reflect your success in grad school, and so it's not a particularly good filter. It's not a good way to assess whether somebody's gonna be good or not. And so at FSU, we have uh, gotten rid of our GRE uh, acceptance. So hopefully it saves you some money. There's still gonna be an application fee involved. You're still gonna have to submit everything, but not a GRE score. All right, so that's your application. And so you're gonna put that to stuff together. There's gonna to be different submission portals. It's it's gonna vary university to university. They're gonna have you know the main university submission process. You're gonna fill in certain things. Um, uh, it's gonna really depend on a university to university, university basis. There's also gonna be an application fee. And so these range typically, pro I think it's somewhere between like 30 and $60 per university. And so you really wanna whittle down. You don't wanna to waste too much money um, in terms of applying for programs you want to you know aim high but also have some safety schools do a range of schools but also don't spend too much money i think it's not unusual for people to apply to five to ten graduate programs but that's something you want to save up for because that can add up pretty quickly if you're applying for 10 programs and they're 60 bucks each you're already spending 600 dollars on that fall uh, application cycle all right, so you've submitted your application. That's out of your hands. Um, that's deadline's typically going to be December 1st to December 15th. It's typically early December. At FSU, our deadline is December 15th. And then it's out of your hands. And so what's going to happen is it's going to go to admissions committee, and that's going to be late December to February. There's going to be some kind of admissions process. And so at least at Florida State University and most universities, it's gonna be a committee, right? This is a lot of work for one person to go over. At Florida State, we had something like 450 applications last year. That is a lot of applications to go for, go through, and I don't wanna do that alone. And so we actually have a committee made of six members who are gonna evaluate these applications. And so that committee is gonna to get together. They're gonna to say, you know, how, how do we wanna partition this content? And so at Florida State University, we partition it. Don't worry, these are made up names. You can completely ignore these. But for the most part, we get a spreadsheet that looks something like this. It has a first name, a last name, a major, a university, a GPA, uh, might have GRE scores on there if somebody submits them. It's going to have a priority list. And then we're also going to have a folder that's going to have basically every application package. And so in these packages, this is where your cover letter, your transcript, your letters of recommendation, all of it goes, gets piled together. And so as a, as a team, as, a, as six members, we basically partition these applications and say, you guys look at these 50, you look at these 50 you look at these 50 and then we're going to make a decision based on you know who's above our bar who gets priority admission or early admission and it, it's really uh, again there's there's some cases where it's obvious some borderline cases where the committee has to discuss and basically say you know are they above their bar if not if they're not above the bar do they have exceptional research experience that might push them over that bar and should we admit them or not so uh, again it's individuals looking at these but uh, at least as far as i know at florida state university we read through every single application um, during this process.
And so after the committee looks through those, we're going to tend to admit people. And there's a certain balance we have to strike. Like we can't admit everyone. Even if everyone's over the bar, we can't do that. Instead, we have to balance our numbers. Typically at Florida State, we want an incoming class between 35 and 40. And so if we have a 50% acceptance rate out of domestic students, that tells us what number of people we can admit out of the system. And so once we've decided that, once we have a certain number of admits, we'll actually, um, in, in our case, we do a, a phone call call. We call the individuals and we say, hey, you, you've been unofficially admitted to uh, Florida State University. The reason we say unofficially admitted is because um, the admission process has to go through the university. And so while the department can admit you to uh, the program, it's unofficial until the university approves it. And so they have to do like the official transcript. They have to do the, the double checking all the information and things like that. But I'd say like 99% of the time, especially for domestic students, if you're unofficially admitted by the department, you are admitted to the university eventually. And so Hopefully sometime, you know, between December and March, usually it comes out December, January, February, late December, uh, for sure January and February, you'll get a phone call, especially the domestic students, sometimes that it can stretch out into March and things like that. And so they'll, it's, it's fun on our end giving a phone call that says, hey, you're admitted to the program, congratulations, we look forward to meeting you during visitation. And so yeah, application is in, hopefully you get a phone call and or an email that says you're admitted to the program. And then after that, we have something called visitation weekends. And so these typically occur in February or March. Um, and this is pretty common across a lot of different chemistry programs. But what the visitation weekend is, is basically we're going to pay to fly you out to Florida State University and spend a couple days in our department. And so here's just a rough example of the schedule. Um, it, it's going to vary dramatically depending on university, at least the, the, the technicalities of the schedule. But for the most part, you're going to have some kind of general introduction, um, breakfast and things like that, uh, presentations by faculty. You'll have meetings one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one meetings with different faculty members. You'll have, probably have a facilities tour and any other tour they want to give. That could include campus. You'll have time to meet with students and discuss with students. Um, in our case, we do that at lunch. We have a Q&A with students at lunch. And then we'll have a poster session at night and things like that. And so, um, yeah, it's a, basically a chance to visit the university. We do other things like we'll have brunch out at the Res, which is our, 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 our activity center at Florida State University. So you get to see a little bit of the town as well as the university and campus and things like that. And so your general goals with this visitation weekend. And so um, not just research-based, but you want to experience the town and the university, right? You're, you're not just living in a lab all the time. You are going to have to live in the town and the location that you're going to. And so this is a reasonable opportunity to get a feel for what that's like. Like how big is the city? How small is it? Uh, gives you a feel for the department culture. Remember earlier I mentioned about collaborative versus competitive. This is when you kind of want to answer those questions and also get all your other questions answered. You, you can be brutally honest with faculty and students and get your answers. Whatever you have questions about, this is your opportunity to ask, right? You've already been admitted to the program. Very rarely I've ever, ever seen an offer rescinded because something happened at visitation weekend. Uh, barring any criminal action of some kind, you're unlikely to get your offer rescinded. And so if you want your questions answered, this is the time to do it. You're, you're here to be recruited to the program and see if you're a good fit. And so that's something to note. It's like, there's no benefit to us during these recruiting weekends to lie to you, right? We want to get people that are going to be a good fit to the program. And this is our opportunity to answer questions and find out if you're a fit to that program. And so beyond the, the city, the department and culture and things like that, you really want to find out about research. Like most of your time in graduate school is spent doing research. And so one, you want to find someone you want to work for. Two, you want to find a group you want to work with. Three, project goals and alignment. And four, something you would like to do on a daily basis. And so these are the four priorities, or the four areas I'd say you should consider most in terms of deciding on a research area or a research group. If you have all four of these, graduate school is awesome. And so th this isn't a priority priority list. There's no particular order to these, but you want to get along with the people around you. You want to work for somebody that you respect and get along with. You want to work on projects that you're passionate about. That's that project goal alignment. And also you got to care about what you do on a daily basis. And if you have all four of these, graduate school is an awesome experience. And so this visitation weekend is your first real chance to get a look at this information. And so these last two, you can kind of glean from a website, but actual interactions with people, this is your first time to do like a meeting with the faculty member and their students and you get to ask a lot of questions and gain insights into the process into how their research groups work. 
And so that's your visitation weekends. And after that, you're going to have time to decide. And if you get into several schools, you'll have several visitation weekends. You'll get to compare the different universities to each other, compare the research groups, uh, compare salaries, compare locations, and start making a decision on where you want to go. And so in turn, regards to decisions, April 15th is a pretty much universal deadline uh, across all R1 institutions. And so this one's actually kind of interesting. So there's this Council of Graduate Schools, which has basically every major research institution. They have a resolution regarding graduate scholars, fellows, trainees, and assistants. And so what this ba document basically did is it, it protects the students. And so it said it's, it's basically a treaty that says no one has to decide anything until April 15th. And the reason they decided this is it would essentially be unfair to students if, if we admitted you and said, you have to decide by December 26th whether you're going to join our program or not. And the one reason we might do that is we want to control the number of uh, people admitted. And so if that person says no, we can admit another person and another, and we can actually get the exact number we want. But it's not for good for you as a student because you might not have heard back from other schools yet. And so this treaty basically protects you from that. It says you don't have to make any decision on any graduate at school until April 15th. And so here's the actual text from the documents. Students are under no obligation to respond to an offer of financial support prior to April 15th. If a person accepts an offer but wants to change, the applicant must first inform the program they are withdrawing or resigning from. Once they have informed the program they are withdrawing, they can accept any other offers. And so even before this April 15th deadline, if you accepted an offer and then you get a late admission somewhere else and you're excited about them, you can still turn down that offer as long as you do it before April 15th. And so that's where that April 15th deadline comes on. And like I said, you can look at the list here or look it up, uh, Council of Graduate Schools uh, resolution regarding to graduate scholars, you'll find a list and they're all going to adhere to this April 15th deadline. So you've made the decision, you've got into grad school, congratulations, um, you know where you're going and then in the fall of the subsequent year, typically you're going to start in August or September depending on the university and whether they're in quarters or semesters, but then you're going to start graduate school. So in terms of the graduate school experience, it will vary from university to university, but I think there's some general themes throughout this. And so what you're seeing on the screen right now, this is the schedule essentially at Florida State University, but any uh, university I've been to as a graduate student or postdoc has a similar timeline. Maybe the details vary in terms of qualifying exams and entrance exams and stuff like that. But in general, this will give you a rough idea what's going on. And so note, this is specific to FSU, but could be generally applied a lot of other places. All right, so here's the timeline. Uh, first week, you're gonna have orientation, first year classes, plus lab exploration, plus teaching assistantship, uh, at FSU research presentation, then candidacy exam, then a data defense, and then a thesis and defense at year four to six. So the orientation is exactly what it sounds like. Like you're arriving at a new university, not only that, but you have to get in the system and things like that. Here's a rough schedule of our orientation, at least the fall of 2022 orientation for grad students. It stays pretty consistent year to year. And so things to think about are things that'll be happening during orientation. Intake paperwork, so you can get in the system, you can get registered for classes, you can actually get paid, um, you know, social security card, get your numbers in, all that stuff. Other things like safety training, just so you're approved to go work in a lab, not only that, but you have TA training, so you can actually teach classes. Um, and by teach classes, we mean you, for the most part, are gonna babysit lab but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, there might be advice on teaching or teaching tips from like uh, like the Center for Advancement of Teaching and things like that. We'll come in and give lectures to students about, you know, here's advice on teaching and grading and things like that. Uh, the other thing that you'll have, at least at Florida State University, is faculty research presentations. This is basically faculty saying, here's my research. If you're interested, come and talk to me and we can set up a time to meet or we can set up a time for you to do a lab rotation. And so that's orientation. And so for us, that's two weeks. Um, it's, it's like four or five hours a day over a two week interval. So it's a lot of stuff, but also you just arrived in town. This is getting you in the system and familiarizing you with the uh, department of chemistry. And so it's worthwhile. It's, it's a bit of a slog, but after that you'll be acceptable to teach. You'll also get paid and things like that. And so beyond orientation, your first year, you're going to register for classes. And so at Florida State, it's five classes, uh, used to be six. Uh, it's pretty typical that you do two or three classes a semester for one to three semesters. And so um, these classes uh, typically are going to range um, depending on what your, your domain of interest is. And so at Florida State, we have these different, you know, 
domains, analytical biochemistry and organic materials organic. We have things we would call core courses and things that are special topics courses. And so these are something, again, it'll vary depending on how you decide this, but at Florida State, you're not accepted to a particular area of research, but instead you're accepted to our program. And so ultimately you get to pick any class you want that's available in that fall and spring semester. And so you want to spread out topics a little bit, but also find expertise that's going to be relevant to your ultimate research goals. So again, at Florida State University, typically students take two classes the first semester, three classes the second semester, and then they're ultimately done with classes for the classes for the remaining of grad remainder of grad school. And so that's uh, that's one of the major differences between graduate and undergraduate. Undergraduate, you take classes the entire time. That's your goal is to get a certain number of credits. Credits in graduate school, it's it's you want to get the classes done so you can get in lab and do research because it's ultimately about um, building your research program building a you know a, a research topic and something you can defend by the end of your thesis and so you're trying to get papers out you're trying to get you know publications so you can build this uh, body of work this body of research that you can share by the time you have your thesis and so um, classes um, we can debate back and forth whether they're important but uh, they're important at the very least in the sense that you have to pass them to stay into graduate school and so the other thing that happens during the first year in, at FSU, it's the first semester, is something called lab explorations. And this is, this is your opportunity to visit different labs, visit different research groups and group meetings and things like that, and ultimately decide or prioritize which group you want to join. And so at FSU, we have a process. Uh, basically, you can see the document right here that every student has to fill out. We have three different phases in this rotation process. Phase one, you have to meet with at least fa three faculty members. And so you remember I said during orientation, uh, you essentially have presentations by all the faculty members that are taking students. If one of those presentations was intriguing to you, you email that professor and say, hey, I'd like to set up a time to meet. And so you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the professor and they'll sign your form that says, hey, I met with this student, we're gonna talk more. And then phase two is doing an actual lab exploration. And so this can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different groups. This could be simple as attending group meeting. Uh, other times it'll be going in lab and actually doing a task. And so it can vary dramatically. Uh, the point of this is to get your get in lab and actually see what people do on a daily day to day basis and also see you know, professor-student interaction, interactions between students. This is where you actually get a feel for the lab culture. Like what, what happens in that lab? Do people get along? Are they, you know, against each other? What do they do on a daily basis? This answers several of those questions in terms of deciding which research group you want to join. And so you meet with the faculty, then you visit their lab, and then ultimately you're going to make a priority list. It's basically going to say, here's my number one priority group, here's number two, here's number three. And so there's, there's a selection process after after that, which I won't go into, but um, a majority of people, like 90 to 95%, get their first priority during this process. The other thing that happens during your first year is uh, a teaching assistantship. And so this is uh, at least a requirement at Florida State University. One, because your first semester, you're not actually joined a group yet, and so there's no advisor there to pay you. And so your job is essentially to be a teaching assistant, a teaching assistant. And so there's two types of teaching assistant positions, again, at Florida State University. There's a laboratory TA and a recitation TA. And so laboratory is basically, you're gonna monitor two to three labs per week. And so these labs are already typically written, they've already been vetted. Your job is to mostly make sure the students are safe and then answer questions as those questions arise. And so you're gonna have, you're gonna have lab time, you're gonna have time in actual lab watching students. You also typically have office hours as well as grading like lab reports and things like that. The other type of TA, which we typically don't have first year students do, but it's it sometimes happens, which is a rec recitation TA. Um, this is basically, at least at Florida State University, is in addition to the, say, three hours of class you have with the professor, it's basically another class period that can be you know used in many different ways. This could be a glorified office hour. This could be um, actual teaching of the class, covering additional content that the professor didn't cover. Um, typically, it's gonna be three one-hour class periods plus office hours plus these are the people that typically exam uh, grade exams for the professor during the actual class and so laboratory and class at least at Florida State are detached so these are two separate things and you probably end up doing a, a little bit of both during your entire graduate career 
All right, so the second thing we have, or the thing we have in our second year for graduate students is a research presentation. And so this is a, kind of an informal talk. It's, it's not super high stress, but one thing we insisted on at Florida State University is that a pre student presents basically every year of their progression. And so first year, that's typically done in classes. Second year, it's gonna be during this. Third year, it's gonna be a qual. Fourth year is a research presentation, and then ultimately your defense. And so this is an opportunity to practice in front of a full audience. And so here's an example from Drake Beery giving a talk uh, this is back in 2018. He graduated about two years ago. Um, but in our case, this the second year talk is a, is a seminar to everyone. Anyone in the department can come visit. Typically, it's going to be area specific. For example, Drake presented in the material seminar. And so this was a 20 minute presentation with five to 10 minutes for questions. And so this isn't expected to be a results talk. It's more of a, you know, here's an introduction to what area I'm going into. And so essentially, you're first year you're TAing, you're, you're um, taking classes, you're also deciding on a research group, which you don't formally join until November of your first year. And so by the time your second year comes around, you've only been really working in a lab for six months, maybe a little bit more. And so it's not an expectation that you have a whole lot of research results, but it is an expectation that you understand what your project is and why you're doing it. And hopefully you have some preliminary results to present, some you know information saying, you know, here's where I am and ultimately here's where I want to go. And so it's, it's, it's a good practice talk as well as to show everyone, hey, I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. So uh, enjoy my presentation. All right, in the third year, we have another presentation called the PhD, PhD Candidacy Exam. And this is the big hurdle beyond classes. So, so if somebody's going to uh, wash out of grad school, they're either going to fail classes, which usually is because they just decided not to try in classes at all. The other major hurdle is the PhD Candidacy Exam. And so this is a presentation instead of in front of the whole department or in front of uh, whoever wants to attend your seminar. This is only your committee members. And so we typically have four or five committee members and it's going to be your research advisor plus typically two people in your area one not in your area and then a university representative which is somebody not in your department and so this candidacy, candidacy exam at Florida State has a few different parts uh, the the first component is the written component which is a research proposal and so the goal of the candidacy is basically saying, hey, here's all the work I'm done, I've done, and here's the work I want to do before I'll get a PhD. And so this is basically outlining your subsequent two and a half to three years of research. And so we do this in the form of a research proposal, which makes sense because you're proposing future work. And so in our case, we want it similar to an NSF NIH type proposal, uh, less than 12 pages. Uh, NSF number is actually 15, but we, we said 12 pages because this is not a formal proposal. But you want to want to talk about, you know, your aims, your background, why you're doing these things, what preliminary data you have, and what additional research you need to do to get your PhD or what you're proposing to do that would merit you getting a PhD. And so beyond the written component, we have an oral component, which for us is broken into two different, two different parts. One is you defend your research proposal. And then the second part is basically uh, fundamental knowledge and chemistry. And so these aren't necessarily two independent parts. Um, we can ask fundamental knowledge questions during your research proposal, but this is just a general, like, do you know enough about chemistry to answer questions about your research? Like if you push a, show a graph on the screen, do you know what the X and Y axis represent? Do you know how that information was acquired? Do you know how this measurement works? Um, you know, do you know equilibrium and rate constants and where those come from? And so all of that shows up in this oral component. And so you give us a written document and then a month later or so you give this oral presentation and that's you defending your research and showing that you're knowledgeable in chemistry. And this is the last major hur hurdle before you're a PhD candidate. And so, like I said, passing classes, uh, passing your candidacy exam. After that, you're officially a PhD candidate. And so um, this is also the threshold where you, you can um, leave with a master's if you so choose. After you pass this, you'll officially have a master's degree on your way to a PhD. And so, yeah, after you pass, you are officially a PhD candidate. And so, again, this is the, the major hurdle in graduate school. I think this is true in most programs. This is showing, hey, I'm not just a robot executing tasks in lab. I actually understand my project and I know where my project's going and I know how to troubleshoot and I know how to be challenged on these ideas. And so I'm progressing towards being an independent research scientist. 
So we at FSU have a fourth year data defense. And so this, again, it goes into the philosophy of we want students to present at least once a year. And so in the fourth year, we have something called the data defense. And here's an actual quote from our, our handbook. The data defense will demonstrate the PhD committee that the PhD candidate has collected sufficient data of adequate quality to assemble the dissertation. So this is basically your opportunity to show, hey, I'm, I'm not quite done yet, but I have enough to start writing a, a dissertation. I have enough to that it's gonna be a year from now, I'm gonna be able to defend a thesis that has actual results in it. And so that's what the fourth year data defense is for. And this is much more laid back than uh, the, the, the candidacy exam. Um, it's gonna be more in depth than your second year talk, obviously, but uh, as far as I can tell from my students, it's a lot more fun. And so this is again, an area seminar. Uh, that's a presentation by Yan Zhao. Um, it's typically in our case is a 40 to 50 minute presentation with 10 to 20 minutes for questions. And so this is approaching the length of a, a PhD defense. And it should. You're in your fourth year. You've been doing research for three years. You should have a pretty solid body of work. And then, like I said, it's a little bit more laid back than the candidacy exam. Here's an example from Yen showing me as uh, as Gru and her and her undergrad Corey as minions, which is a reasonable relationship for the grad student uh, professor relationship. But again, this is the kind of thing you can do in your fourth year talk, especially if you've worked as hard as Yen did and showed I have a lot of results to present. And so uh, it can be fun practice. It can also be uh, showing your committee you know what you're doing. Um, you're, you're progressing towards your def PhD in defense. So then ultimately after everything you've done in the lab, all the research you've put together, um, you're gonna have a thesis and you're gonna have a defense. And so at Florida State University, our, on average, our students take 5.2 years between starting and uh, graduating. And so uh, thesis is the, the written document. This is um, basically a compilation of all your research. And so sometimes people describe this as stapling your papers together. If you have four or five papers, you basically put an introduction, you have a conclusion, and you put your papers in between them. Um, and so this is, uh, and in many ways, this is a formality, like the research is already done. This is just putting a document behind it. So you compile, you know, 100 to 300 pages of content. But the other thing to think about in a thesis is this is you highlighting your unique contribution to science. This is this is your opportunity to show I have learned something that no one knew before. And here it is in this document. And so this is like your 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 opus of your research experience. You spent so much time in lab. Your thesis and dissertation is an opportunity to tell that story. Tell the tell you tell everyone what you created out of this process. And so after that, you're going to have a defense. And so you're going to give your committee your thesis. They're going to read through it and make comments and things like that. And then you're actually going to defend your research uh, during a presentation. And so at Florida State University, this is an open presentation, typically 45 to 50 minutes long, 10 minutes for questions from the audience. And then after the audience is finished asking questions, they leave the room and then it's 30 to 60 minutes of questions from the committee. And so this is, uh, again, this is very rarely will somebody fail a defense. It's more of a, this is your opportunity to show that you know more than anyone else in the room about your project. And you should, that at that point, when you get to your defense, you should be the world's foremost expert in your particular area. And this dissertation, this defense is an opportunity to show that. You get to present and you get to, to share with everyone everything you did and you get to answer questions. And more often than not, during these question and answer sessions, it's really about, you know, uh, what did you learn? What were the the failures, like uh, you're, you're challenged by the committee in the way that you would be in peer review or in a grant proposal. Like, do you know what you're talking about? What were the limitations? How did you troubleshoot? Things like that. And so ultimately after that, you get to go to a hooding ceremony. And so this is a pretty amazing tradition. Basically, after you've gotten your PhD or when you've you know passed your thesis in defense, you get to go to the actual hooding ceremony where you get hooded and you are officially a doctorate of chemistry. And so... I'm not a big fan of tradition for the sake of the tradition, but this is one that I will uh, strongly advocate for as I strongly recommend everyone go to the hooding ceremony because it is an honor and it's a thousand year old tradition where it's passed down from professor to student and so on and so forth for generations and generations. And so culmination of your work, sure, all the work is done already, but you might as well go to the ceremony and graduate. All right.
So that's the timeline at Florida State University. Orientation, classes, lab exploration, choosing an advisor, uh, teaching assistantship during that first year, plus after that first year, it's going to depend on an advisor, whether they have money and whether they want to pay for you, whether you'll be on TA or RA. Then you'll have a research presentation, PhD candidacy exam, data defense, and thesis and defense. And after 5.2 years, you have a PhD, you get hooded, congratulations, you are Dr. So-and-so. And so it's easy to get caught up in the logistics of that, but one thing I want to step back at the end of this presentation and just show this, this example from Matthew Might. Uh, I think he's a computer science professor at University of Utah, but he basically said, I mean, let's reflect on what actually happens in graduate school. And so just a really fun walkthrough on this. Um, you can imagine this circle contains all of human knowledge. By the time you finish elementary school, high school, bachelor's degree, you've gained some knowledge. At bachelor's, you start to get a little bit narrower scope, so you start to become an expert in this particular area. Then you go on f f uh, forward, you do research, you read research papers, and then at some point you reach the boundary of human knowledge. And then that's right here. And so you basically come to a point, you've learned as much as that has happened in the past, and then you spend three years in graduate school grinding away and trying to come up with new knowledge. And then at some point you break through, and that's your PhD right that contribution right there it's just adding on the compendium of all of human knowledge you have carved out a unique thing that no one else knew before and you are the world's foremost expert in that and it is a small fraction of the bigger circle but nonetheless you hope that what you've done contributes to the growth and the expansion of your field whether that can contribution is something you directly expect or it's an indirect outcome the point is that you have brought something new to the table and that's what your thesis and dissertation should be it should be here's my unique contribution here's my little fraction of knowledge that I've created that no one had ever seen before. And maybe no one reads it, maybe only your parents read it, um, but the literature that you produce in terms of peer-reviewed literature is probably where you're going to have the greatest impact. And so, yeah, that's the important thing. I know it's, it's hoop jumping and you have a bunch of steps along the way, but ultimately you're trying to become the world's most expert. You're trying to train a skill set. You're trying to train, you know, your skills using instruments and tools and troubleshooting problems. And that's really with the goal of creating this tiny, fraction of new knowledge. And so after you've done that, then it's off to, I guess, what we'd call the real world, which I've never been officially a part of, but this could be, you know, industry, government labs, academia, postdocs, whatever it might be, the next step in your endeavors. And then the important thing to note about grad school is you're going to become an expert in a very narrow scope of knowledge. But the likelihood that you continue to pursue whatever you are working on is very, very low. In fact, you, 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 you'll shift domains of research every you know, five to 10 years for the rest of your career. And that's because you have to ebb and flow with what's hot, what has funding, what is the new next big thing. And so what your PhD is actually doing for you is not training you in a particular expertise, but training you in a broader skill set, the ability to learn things on your own, the ability to le read literature, to understand things, to trouble troubleshoot things, um, uh, to develop a tool set. I know these sets of instrumentations and I know how they work. And so you can step into any lab and say, oh yeah, I know how that works and I know how that works. And that's what really, regardless of where you go next, I mean, short of going to say patent law or something like that, graduate school is training you how to be a researcher more so than to do the particular research you're working on. And so that's that's really what these next steps in the process are, are looking for. And so that is the goal with this. And again, there's a lot of hoop jump and you're trying to progress a particular domain of research, but you're developing as a scientist, as an independent thinker, as someone who's creative and can come up with and troubleshoot their own problems. So that's it. After that, you've officially obtained a PhD. And so this is the uh, Chemistry Graduate School Demystified Talk, everything from application off to getting after your PhD. This is pretty much everything I have to share on the topic. And so normally when I'm presenting in person, this is the point where I'd ask for questions. Uh, since this is a YouTube video, if you guys have questions, you can feel free to email me at hansen at chem.fsu.edu or kghansen at fsu.edu. Um, but yeah, uh, pretty much everything I have to share on the topic is in this video, but if you have questions, send me an email. Best of luck with your application and your graduate school experience.